chapter 1, section 4. Is anarcho-capitalism a new form of individualist anarchism? Some so-called anarcho-capitalists shy away from the term, preferring such expressions as market anarchist or individualist anarchist. This suggests that there is some link between their ideology and that of Tucker. However, the founder of so-called anarcho-capitalism, Murray Rothbard, refused that label for, while strongly tempted, he could not do so because Spooner and Tucker have, in a sense, preempted that name for their doctrine and that from, and that, from that doctrine I have certain differences. Somewhat incredibly, Rothbard argued that, on the whole, politically, these differences are minor. Economically, the differences are substantial, and this means that my view of the consequences of putting our more or less common system into practice is far, very far from theirs. You can see the Spooner-Tucker Doctrine and Economist View in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, Volume 20, Number 1, Page 7 for this quote. What an understatement. Individualist anarchists advocated an economic system in which there would have been very little inequality of wealth and so of power, and the accumulation of capital would have been minimal without profit, interest, and rent. Removing this social and economic basis would result in substantially different political regimes. This can be seen from the fate of Viking Iceland, where a substantially communal and anarchistic system was destroyed from within by increasing inequality and the rise of tenant farming. In other words, politics is not isolated from economics. As David Wick put, uh, Wick put it, Rothbard writes of society as though some part of it, government, can be extracted and replaced by another arrangement while other things go on before. And he constructs a system of police and judicial power without any consideration of the influence of historical and economic context. See Anarchist Justice in Nomos Penenchap, uh, Penikin Chapman editions, page 227. Unsurprisingly, the political differences he highlights are significant, namely the role of law in the jury system and the land question. The former differences relates to the fact that the individualist anarchists allowed each individual free market court, and more specifically each free market jury, totally free reign over judicial decision. This horrified Rothbard. The reason is obvious, as it allows real people to judge the law as well as the facts, modifying the former as society changes and evolves. For Rothbard, the idea that ordinary people should, let alone could, have a say in the law is dismissed outright. Rather, quote, it would not be a very difficult task for libertarian lawyers and jurists to arrive at a rational and objective code of libertarian legal principles and procedures. Of course, the fact that lawyers and jurists may have a radically different idea of what is just than those subject to their laws is not raised by Rothbard. <laughs> Never mind, answered. While Rothbard notes that juries may defend the people against the state, the notion that they may defend the people against the authority and power of the rich is not raised. That is why the rich have tended to oppose juries as well as popular assemblies. Unsurprisingly, the few individualist anarchists that remained pointed this out. Lawrence Labadee, the son of Tucker, associate uh, Joseph Labadee, argued in response to Rothbard as follows, quote, Mere common sense would suggest that any court would be influenced by experience and any free market court or judge would be in the very nature of things, have some precedents guiding them in their instructions to a jury. But since no case is exactly the same, a jury would have considered would have considerable say about the heinousness of the offense in each case, realizing that circumstances alter cases and prescribing penalty accordingly. This appeared to Spooner and Tucker to be a more flexible and equitable administration of justice, possible or feasible, human beings what they are. 
But when Mr. Rothbard quibbles about the jurisprudential ideas of Spooner and Tucker, and at the same time upholds, presumably in his courts, the very economic evils which are at the bottom, the very reason for human contention and conflict, he would seem to be a man who chokes at a gnat while swallowing a camel. In other words... To exclude the general population from any say in the law and how it changes is hardly a minor difference, particularly if you're proposing an economic system which is based on inequalities of wealth, power, and influence and the means of accumulating more. It's like a supporter of the state saying that it's a minor difference if you favor a dictatorship rather than a democratically elected government. As Tucker argued, quote, It is precisely in the tempering of the rigidity of enforcement that one of the chief excellences of anarchism consists. Under anarchism, all rules and laws will be little more than suggestions for the guidance of juries, and that all disputes will be submitted to juries which will judge not only the facts but the law, the justice of the law, its applicability to the given circumstances, and the penalty or damage to be inflicted because of its infraction. Under anarchism, the law will be regarded as just in proportion to its flexibility instead of now in proportion to its rigidity. Individual Anarchist, pages 160 to 161. In others, the law will evoke to take into account changing social circumstances and as a consequence, public opinion on specific events and rights. Tucker's position is fundamentally democratic and evolutionary, while Rothbard's is autocratic and fossilized. On the land question, Rothbard opposed the individualist position of occupancy and use, as it would automatically abolish all rent payments for land. Hmm. Which was precisely why the individualist anarchist advocated for it in the first place. In a predominantly rural economy, this would result in a significant leveling of income and social power, as well as bolstering the bargaining position of non-land workers by reducing unemployment. He, of course, bemoans that landlords cannot charge rent on their justly acquired private property without noticing that it's begging the question as anarchists deny that this is justly acquired land. Unsurprisingly, Rothbard considers the property theory of land ownership as John Locke's, ignoring the fact that the first self-proclaimed anarchist book was written to refute that kind of theory. Property is theft, after all. His argument simply shows how far from anarchism his ideology is. For Rothbard, it goes without saying that the landlord's freedom of contract tops the worker's freedom to control their own work and live and, of course, their right to life. However, for anarchists, the land is indispensable to our existence, consequently a common thing, consequently insusceptible of, 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 uh, of appropriation. Proudhon, what is property? Page 107. The reason question is why Rothbard considers this a political difference rather than an economic one. Unfortunately, he doesn't explain, perhaps because the underlying socialist perspective behind the anarchist position, or perhaps the fact that feudalism and monarchism was based on the ownership of the land being its ruler suggests a political aspect to the ideology best left unexplored. They are neo-feudalists after all. Given that the idea of grounding rulership on land ownership receded during the Middle Ages, it may be unwise to note that under so-called anarcho-capitalism, the landlord and capitalist would likewise be sovereign over the land and those who used it. As we noted in Section 1, this is the conclusion that Rothbard does draw after all. As such, there is a political aspect to this difference. Of course, Rothbard is simply skimming the surface. There are two ways so-called anarcho-capitalists differ from individualist anarchists. The first one 
is the fact that the individualist anarchists are socialists. The second is on whether equality is essentially is essential or not to anarchism. Each will be discussed in turn. Unlike both individualist and social anarchists, so-called anarcho-capitalists support capitalism, a pure free market type which has never existed, although it has been approximated occasionally. This means that they reject totally the ideas of anarchists which, with regards to property and economic analysis. For example, like all supporters of capitalists, they consider rent, profit, and interest as valid incomes. Of course, not if they truly studied Adam Smith, you know, the father of capitalism who was against the rentier class entirely. In contrast, all anarchists consider these as exploitation and agree with the individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker, for example, when he argued that whoever contributes to production is alone entitled. What has no rights that who is bound to respect? What is a thing? Who is a person? Things have no claims. They exist only to be claimed. The possession of a right cannot be predicated of, de uh, of dead material, but only of a living thing. This, we must note, is the fundamental critique of the capitalist theory, that capital is productive. In and of themselves, fixed costs do not create value. Rather, value is creation depends on how investments are developed and used once in place. Because of this, the individualist anarchists, like other anarchists, consider non-labor-derived income as usury, unlike so-called anarcho-capitalists. Similarly, anarchists reject the notion of capitalist property rights in favor of possession, including the full fruits of one's labor. For example, anarchists reject private, pro uh, private ownership of land in favor of an occupancy and use regimen. See, in this, we follow Proudhon's What is Property and argue that property is theft. Rothbard, as noted, rejects this perspective. As these ideas are essentially a part, uh, essential part of anarchist politics, they cannot be removed without seriously damaging the rest of the theory. This can be seen from Tucker's comments that liberty insists on the abolition of the state and the abolition of usury. On no more government of man by man and no more exploitation of man by man. He indicates that anarchism has specific economic and political ideas that it opposes capitalism along with the state. Therefore, anarchism was never purely a political concept, but always combined in opposition to oppression with an opposition to exploitation. The social anarchists made exactly the same point. Which means that when Tucker argued that liberty insists on socialism, true socialism, anarchistic socialism, the pre prevalence of earth of liberty, equality, and solidarity, he knew exactly what he was saying, and he likely meant it wholeheartedly. So because so-called anarcho-capitalists embrace capitalism and reject socialism, communalism, communism, and other forms of communitarianism— they cannot be considered anarchists or a part of any anarchist tradition. Which brings us nicely to the second point, namely, the lack of concern for equality. In stark contrast to anarchists of, uh, anarchists of all schools, inequality is not to be a problem with these so-called anarcho-capitalists. However, it is a truism that not all traders are equally subject to the market, i.e. have the same market power. In many cases, a few have sufficient control of resources to influence or determine price, and in such cases, all others must submit to those terms or not buy the commodity. When the commodity is labor power, even this option is lacking. Workers have, have to accept a job in order to live. As will be argued in section 10.2, Workers are usually at a disadvantage on the labor market when compared to capitalists, and this forces them to sell their liberty in return for making profits for others. These profits increase inequality in society as the property owners receive the surplus value their workers produce. This is the labor theory of value. And while you may think this is Marx, this is Smith, the father of capitalism pointed this out.
This increases inequality further, consolidating market power, and so weakens the bargaining position of workers further, ensuring that even the freest competition possible could not eliminate class power in society, something Tucker recognized as occurring with the development of trusts within capitalism. By removing the underlying commitment to abolish non-labor income, any anarchist capitalist society would have vast differences in wealth and, and so power. Instead of a government imposed monopolies in land, money, and so on, the economic power flowing from private property and capital would ensure that the majority remained in, to use Spooner's words, the condition of servants. The individualist anarchists were aware of this danger and so supported economic ideas that opposed usury, the rentier class, rent, profit, interest, and ensured the worker the full value of his, her, or their labor. While not all of them called these ideas socialist, it is clear that these ideas are socialist in nature and in aim. Similarly, not all individualist anarchists called themselves anarchists, but their ideas are clearly anarchist in nature and in aim. The combination of the political and economic is essential as they mutually reinforce each other. Without the economic ideas, the political ideas would be meaningless as inequality would make a mockery of them. As Klein notes, the individualist anarchists' proposals were designed to establish true equality of opportunity, and they expected this would result in a society without great wealth or poverty. In the absence of monopolistic factors which would distort competition, they expected a society largely of self-employed workmen with no significant disparity of wealth between them, since all would be required to live at their own expense and not at the expense of exploited fellow human beings. Because of the evil effects of inequality on freedom, both social and individualist anarchists desired to create an environment in which circumstances would not drive people to sell their liberty to others at a disadvantage. In other words, they desired an equalization of market power by opposing interest, rent, and profit in capitalist definitions of private property. Klein summarized this by saying, the American individualist anarchist exposed the tension existing in liberal thought between private property and the ideal of equal access. The individual anarchists were at least aware that existing conditions were far from ideal and that the system itself working against the majority of individuals in their efforts to attain its promises. Lack of capital the means to create and accumulate wealth usually doomed a laborer to a life of exploitation. This the anarchists knew, and they abhorred such a system. It's this desire for bargaining equality that is reflected in their economic ideas. And by removing these underlying economic ideas of the individualist anarchists, these so-called anarcho-capitalists make a mockery of any ideas they do appropriate. Essentially, the individualist anarchists agreed with Rousseau that in order to prevent extreme inequality of fortunes, you deprive people of the means to accumulate in the first place and not take away the wealth from the rich. An important point which, again, so-called anarcho-capitalists fail to even understand, let alone appreciate. There are, of course, overlaps between some of the individualist anarchists and the so-called anarcho-capitalists, just as there are overlaps between it and Marxism and social anarchism. However, just as a similar analysis of capitalism does not make an individualist anarchist Marxist, so apparent similarities between individualist anarchism does not make it a forerunner of anarcho-capitalism. For example, both schools support the idea of free markets. Yet the question of markets is fundamentally second to the issue of property rights. For what is exchanged on the market is dependent on what is considered legitimate property. In this, as Rothbard notes, individualist anarchists and 
so-called anarcho-capitalists differ. And different property rights produce different market structures and different dynamics. This means that capitalism is not the only economy with markets. And so support for markets cannot be equated with support for capitalism. Equally, opposition to markets is not the defining characteristic of socialism, as we will note later on. As such, it is possible to be a market socialist, and many socialists are. This is because markets and property do not equal capitalism. Quote Karl Marx in Das Kapital, Volume 1, page 931. Political economy confuses on principle two very different types of private property. One, which rests on the labor of the producers himself, and the other on the exploitation of the labor of others. It forgets that the latter is not only the direct antithesis of the former, but grows on the former's tomb and nowhere else. In Western Europe, the homeland of political economy, the process of primitive accumulation is more of less accomplished. It is otherwise in the colonies. There, the capitalist regime constantly comes up against the obstacle presented by the producer who, as owner of his own condition of labor, employs that labor to enrich himself instead of the capitalist. The contradiction of these two diametrically opposed economic systems has its practical manifestation here in the struggle between them. Individualist anarchism is obviously an aspect of this struggle, uh, struggle between the system of peasant and artisan production of early America and the state-encouraged system of private property and wage labor. These so-called anarcho-capitalists, in contrast, assume that generalized wage labor would remain under their system while paying lip service to the possibilities of cooperatives. And if a so-called anarcho-capitalist thinks that cooperatives will become the dominant form of workplace organization, then they're some kind of market socialist, not a capitalist. It is clear that their end point, a pure capitalism i.e. generalized wage labor, is directly the opposite of that desired by anarchists. This was the case of the individualist anarchists who embraced the ideal of non-capitalist laissez-faire competition. They did so, as noted, to end exploitation, not to maintain it. Indeed, their analysis of the change in American society from one of mainly independent producers into one based mainly upon wage labor has many parallels with, of all people, Karl Marx presented in chapter 33 of Das Kapital. Marx correctly argues that the capitalist mode of production and accumulation and therefore capitalist private property have for their fundamental condition the annihilation of that private property which rests on the labor of the individual himself. In other words, the expropriation, expropriation of the worker. He notes that to achieve this, the state is then used – how then can the anti-capitalistic cancer of the colonies be healed? Let the government set an artificial price on the virgin soil, a price independent of the law of supply and demand, a price that compels the immigrant to work a long time for wages before he can earn enough money to buy land and turn himself into an independent farmer. Moreover, Tariffs are introduced with, quote, the objective of manufacturing capitalists artificially for the system of production was an artificial means of manufacturing manufacturers or expropriating independent workers, of capitalizing the national means of production and subsistence, and of forcibly cutting short the transition to the modern mode of production. It is this process which individualist anarchists protested against. The use of the state to favor the rising capitalist class. However, unlike social anarchists, many individualist anarchists were not consistently against wage labor. This is the other significant overlap between these so-called anarcho-capitalists and individualist anarchism. However, 
they were opposed to exploitation and argued, unlike the so-called anarcho-capitalists, that in their system, workers' bargaining powers would be raised to a level that their wages would equal the full product of their labor. However, as we will discuss The social context the individualist anarchists lived in must be remembered. America at the time was a predominantly rural society, and industry was not as developed as it is now. Wage labor would have been minimized. Spooner, for example, explicitly envisioned a society made up of mostly entirely of self-employed workers. As Klein argues, quote, Committed as they were to equality in the pursuit of property, the objective for the anarchists became the construction of a society providing equal access to those things necessary for creating wealth. The goal of the anarchists who extolled mutualism and the abolition of all monopolies was then a society where everyone willing to work would have the tools and raw materials necessary for production in a non-exploitative system. The dominant vision of the future society was underpinned by individual self-employed workers. As such, a limited amount of wage labor within a predominantly self-employed economy does not make a given society capitalist. Any more than a small amount of governmental communities within a predominantly anarchist world would make it statist. As Marx argued, when the separation of the worker from the conditions of labor and from the soil does not yet exist or only sporadically or on too limited a scale where, where amongst such curious characters is the field of abstinence for the capitalist. Today's wage labor is tomorrow's independent peasant or artisan working for himself. He vanishes from the labor market but not into the warehouse. There is a constant transformation of wage laborers into independent producers who work for themselves instead of for capital. And so the degree of exploitation of the wage laborer remains indecently low. In addition, the wage laborer also loses, along with the relation of dependence, the feeling of dependence on the abstentious capitalist. I'm sorry, abstemious capitalist. Saying that, as we discuss in a future section, individualist anarchist support for wage labor is at odds with the ideas of Proudhon, and far more importantly, in contradiction to uh, to many of the stated principles of the individualist anarchists themselves. In particular, wage labor violates occupancy, occupancy and use, as well as having more than a passing similarity to the state. However, these problems can't be solved by consistently applying the principles of individualist anarchism, unlike so-called anarcho-capitalism. And that is why it is a real school of anarchism. In other words, a system of generalized wage labor would not be anarchist, nor would it be non-exploitative. Moreover, the social context these ideas were developed in and would have been applied ensured that these contradictions would have been minimized. If they had been applied, a genuine anarchist society of self-employed workers would, in all likelihood, have been created at least first. Whether the market would increase inequalities is a moot point. We must stress that the social situation is important as it shows apparently superficially similar arguments can have radically different aims and results depending on who suggests them and in what circumstances. As noted, during the rise of capitalism, the bourgeoisie were not shy in urging state intervention against the masses. Unsurprisingly, working-class people generally took an anti-state position during this period. The individualist anarchists were a part of that tradition, opposing what Marx termed primitive accumulation in form of the pre-capitalist forms of property and society it was destroying. However, would capitalism found its feet and could do without such obvious intervention, the possibility of an anti-state capitalism could arise. Such a possibility became a definite one once the state started to intervene in uh, in ways which, while benefiting the system as a whole, came into conflict with the property and power of individual members of the capitalist and landlord class. Thus, social legislation which attempted to restrict 
the negative effects of unbridled exploitation and oppression on workers and the environment were having on the economy were, so were the source of much outrage in certain bourgeois circles. Quote, Quite independently of these tendencies of individualist anarchism, the anti-state bourgeoisie, which is also anti-statist, being hostile to any social intervention on the part of the state to protect the victims of exploitation in the matter of working hours, hygienic working conditions, and so on, in the greed of unlimited exploitation, had stirred up in England a certain agitation in favor, in favor of pseudo-individualism in unrestrained exploitation. To this end, they enlisted the services of a mercenary pseudo-literature which played with doctrinaire and fanatical ideas in order to protect a species of individualism that was absolutely sterile and a species of non-interventionism that would let a man die of hunger rather than offend his dignity. Max Netlau, A Short History of Anarchism, page 39. This perspective can be seen when Tucker denounced Herbert Spencer as a champion of the capitalist class for his vocal attacks on social legislation which claim to benefit the working class people but stays silently strange on the laws passed to benefit, usually indirectly, capital and the rich. So-called anarcho-capitalism is a part of that tradition. The tradition associated with a capitalism which no longer needs obvious state intervention as enough wealth has been accumulated to keep workers under control by means of market power. As with the original 19th century British anti-state capitalists like Spencer and Herbert, Rothbard, quote, completely overlooks the role of the state in building and maintaining a capitalist economy in the West privileged to live in the 20th century long after the battles to establish capitalism have been fought and won, Rothbard sees the state solely as a burden on the market and a vehicle for imposing the still greater burden of socialism. He manifests a kind of historical nearsightedness that allows him to collapse many centuries of human experience into one long night of tyranny that ended only with the intervention of the free market and its spontaneous triumph over the past. It is pointless to argue, as Rothbard seems ready to do, that capitalism would have succeeded without the bourgeois state. The fact is that all capitalist nations have relied on the machinery of government to create and preserve the political and legal environments required by their economic system. That, of course, has not stopped him criticizing others for being unhistorical. Stephen L. Newman, Liberalism at Wit's End, pages 77, 78, and 79. In other words... There is substantial differences between the victims of a thief trying to stop being robbed and be left alone to enjoy their property and the successful thief doing the same. Individualist anarchists were aware of this. For example, for example, Victor Yaros stressed this key difference between individualist anarchism and the proto-libertarian capitalists of voluntarianism. Aubert Hubert, Aubert Hubert, uh, believes in allowing people to retain all their possessions, no matter how unjustly and base, uh, base, uh, basely acquired, while getting them, so to speak, to swear off stealing and usurping and to promise to behave well in the future. We, on the other hand, while insisting on the principle of private property in wealth honestly obtained under the reign of liberty, do not think it either unjust or unwise to dispossess the landlords who have monopolized natural wealth by force and fraud. We hold that the poor and disinherited toilers would be justified in expropriating not alone the landlords who notoriously have no equitable titles to their land, but all the financial lords and rulers, all the millionaires and billionaires, and trillionaires, and very wealthy individuals. Almost all possessors of great wealth enjoy neither what they nor their ancestors rightfully acquired. And if Mr. Herbert wishes to challenge the correctness of this state, statement, we are ready to go with him into a full discussion of the subject. If he holds that landlords are justly entitled to their lands, let him make a defense of the landlords or an attack on our unjust proposal. 
quoted by Karl Wattner, the English individualists as they appear in Liberty, pages 191 to 211. Benjamin R. Tucker in The Champions of Liberty, Coughlin, Hamilton, Selvin, pages 199 to 200. Significantly, Tucker and other individualist anarchists saw state intervention as a result of capital manipulating legislation to gain an advantage on the so-called free market, which allowed them to exploit labor. And as such, it benefited the whole capitalist class. Rothbard, at best, acknowledges that some sections of big business benefit from the current system and so fails to have the comprehensive understanding of the dynamics of the capitalist capitalism as a system rather as an ideology this lack of understanding of capitalism as a historic and dynamic system rooted in class rule and economic power is important in evaluating this so-called anarcho-capitalist claims to anarchism Marxists are not considered anarchists as they support the state as a means of transition to an anarchist society. Much the same logic can be applied to right-wing libertarians, even if they do call themselves so-called anarcho-capitalists. This is because they do not seek to correct the inequalities produced by previous state action before ending it, nor do they seek to change the definitions of private property imposed by the state. In effect, they argue that the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie should wither away and be limited to defending the property accumulated in a few hands. Needless to say, starting from the current coercively produced distribution of property and then eliminating force simply means defending the power and privilege of ruling minorities. The modern individualism initiated by Herbert Spencer is, like the critical theory of Proudhon, a powerful indictment against the dangers and wrongs of government, but its practical solution of the social problem is miserable, so miserable as to lead us to inquire if the talk of no force be merely an excuse for supporting landlord and capitalist domination. For these so-called anarcho-capitalists, the concept of freedom is limited to the idea of freedom from. For them, freedom means simply freedom from the initiation of force or the non-aggression against an anyone's person and property. Murray Rothbard for A New Liberty, page 23. It's a direct quote. The notion that real freedom must combine both freedom to and freedom from is missing in their ideology, as is the social context of the, social, uh, of the so-called freedom they defend. Before starting, it's useful to quote Alan Hayworth when he notes that, in fact, it is surprising how little close attention the concept of freedom receives from libertarian writers. Once again, anarchy, state, and utopia is a case in point. The word freedom doesn't even appear in the index. The word liberty appears, but only to refer to the reader, uh, only to refer the reader to Wilt Chamberlain in a passage. In a supposedly libertarian work, this is more surprising. It's truly remarkable. Why is this the case? Can be seen. Oh, why this is the case can be seen from how these so-called anarcho-capitalists define freedom. In a right libertarian or so-called anarcho-capitalist society, freedom is considered to be a product of property. As Murray Rothbard puts it, the libertarian defines the concept of freedom or liberty as a condition in which a person's ownership rights in his body and his legitimate material property rights are not invaded, are not aggressed against. Freedom and unrestricted property rights go hand in hand. This definition has problems, however. In such a society, one cannot legitimately do anything with or on another, uh, another's property if the owner prohibits it. This means that an individual's only guaranteed freedom is determined by the amount of property that he or she or they own. This has the consequence that someone with no property has no guaranteed freedom at all beyond, of course, the freedom to not be murdered or otherwise harmed by deliberate act of others, maybe. In other words, a distribution of property is a distribution of freedom, as the right libertarians themselves define it. 
It strikes anarchists as strange that an ideology that claims to be committed to promoting freedom entails the conclusion that some people should be more free than others? However, this is the logical implication of their view, which raises a serious doubt as to whether so-called anarcho-capitalists are even actually interested in freedom. Looking at Rothbard's definition of liberty quoted, we can see that the freedom is actually no longer considered to be a fundamental independent concept. Instead, freedom is a derivative of something more fundamental, namely the legitimate rights of an individual, which are identified then as property rights. In other words, given that these so-called anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians in general consider the right to property as absolute, it follows that freedom and property become one and the same. This suggests an alternative name for the right libertarian, namely propertarian. And needless to say, if we do not accept that right libertarian view of what constitutes legitimate rights, then their claim to be defenders of liberty is weak at best. Another implication of this liberty as property concept is that it produces a strangely alienated concept of freedom. Liberty, as we noted, is no longer absolute, but a derivative of property. Which has the important consequence that you can sell your liberty and still be considered free by the ideology. This concept of liberty, namely liberty as property, is usually termed self-ownership. But to state the obvious, I don't own myself. As if I were an object somehow separable from my subjectivity. I am myself. However, the concept of self-ownership is handy for justifying various forms of domination and oppression. For by agreeing, usually under the force of circumstances, we must note, to certain contracts, you'll find that libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists love that word. By agreeing to certain contracts, an individual can sell or rent themselves to others. For example, when workers sell their labor power to capitalists on the free market, in effect, self-ownership becomes the means of justifying treating people as objects. Ironically, the very thing the concept was created to stop. As L. Susan Brown noted, at the moment an individual sells labor power to another, they lose self-determination and instead are treated as a subjectless, in, a subjectless instrument for the fulfillment of another's will. Page four of The Politics of Individualism. Given that workers are paid to obey, you really have to wonder which planet Murray Rothbard is on when he argues that a person's labor service is alienable, but his will is not. That he cannot alienate his will, more particularly his control over his own mind and body. He says this literally in The Ethics of Liberty, page 40 and 135. He contrasts private property and self-ownership by arguing that, quote, all physical property owned by a person is alienable, and I can give away or sell to another person my shoes, my house, my car, my money. But there are certain vital things which, in natural fact and in the nature of man, are inalienable. Their will and control over their own person are inalienable. But... Labor services are unlike the private possessions Rothbard lists as being alienable. We will argue later on in Why Do Anarchists Oppose Hierarchy, a person's labor services and will cannot be divided. If you sell your labor services, you also have to give control of your body and mind to another person. If a worker does not obey the commands of their employer, they are fired. That Rothbard denies this indicates a total lack of common sense or potentially bad faith argumentation. Perhaps Rothbard will argue that as the worker can quit at any time, it does not alienate their will. This seems to be his case against slave contracts, but 
This ignores the fact that between the signing and breaking of the contract and during work hours and perhaps outside work hours if the boss has mandatory drug testing or will fire workers who attend union or anarchist meetings or those who have unnatural sexuality and so on, the worker does alienate their will and body. In the words of Rudolf Rocker, quote, under the realities of the capitalist economic form, there can be no talk of a right over one's own person, for that ends when one is compelled to submit to the economic dictation of another if he does not want to starve. Anarcho syndicalism, page 17. Ironically, the rights of property, which are said to flow from an individual's self-ownership of themselves, becomes the means under capitalism by which self-ownership of non-property owners is denied. The foundational right, self-ownership, becomes denied by the derivative right, ownership of things. Under capitalism, a lack of property can be just as oppressive as a lack of legal rights because of the relationships of domination and subjection this situation creates. So Rothbard's argument, as well as being contradictory, misses the point and the reality of capitalism. Yes, if we define freedom as the absence of coercion, then the idea that wage labor does not restrict liberty is unavoidable, but such a definition is useless. This is because it hides the structures of power and relations of domination and subordination. As Carol Payton argued, the contract in which the worker allegedly sells his labor power is a contract in which, since he cannot be separated from his capacities, he sells command over the use of his body and himself. To sell command over the use of oneself for a specified period is to be an unfree laborer. The Sexual Contract, page 151. In other words, <clears throat> contracts about property in the person inevitably create subordination. These so-called so -called, so anarcho-capitalists define this source of unfreedom away, but it still exists and has a major impact on people's liberty. Therefore, freedom is better described as self-government or self-management. To be able to govern one's own actions, if alone, or to, be, or, or to participate in the determination of joint activity, if part of a group. Freedom, to put it another way, is not an abstract legal concept, but a vital concrete possibility for every human being to bring to full development all of their powers, capacities, and talents which nature has endowed them. A key aspect of this is to govern one's own actions when within associations, self-management. We, If we look at freedom this way, we see that coercion is condemned but so is hierarchy, and so is capitalism. For during working hours, people are not free to make their own plans and have a say in what affects them. They are order takers, not free individuals. It's, it is because anarchists have recognized the authoritarian nature of capitalist firms that they have opposed wage labor and capitalist property rights along with the state. They've desired to replace institutions structured by subordination with institutions constituted by free relationships, based, in other words, on self-management in all areas of life, including economic organizations. Hence, Proudhon's argument that the workmen's associations are full of hope, both as a protest against the wage system and as an affirmation of reciprocity. And that their importance lies in, in their denial of the rule of capitalists, money lenders, and governments. The general idea of revolution, pages 98 and 99. Unlike anarchists, the so-called anarcho-capitalists, account of freedom allows an individual's freedom to be rented out to another while maintaining that the person is still free. It may, see, it may seem strange that an ideology proclaiming its support for liberty sees nothing wrong with the alienation and denial of liberty, but in actual fact, it's unsurprising. After all, contract theory is a theoretical strategy that justifies subjection by presenting it as freedom and nothing more. Little wonder, then, that contract creates a relation of subordination and not of freedom. <clears throat> 
Any attempt to build an ethical framework starting from the abstract individual, as Rothbard does with his legitimate rights method, will result in domination and oppression between people, not freedom. Indeed, Rothbard provides an example of the dangers of idealist philosophy that Bakunin warned about when he argued that while materialism denies free will and ends in the establishment of liberty, idealism in the name of human dignity proclaims free will and on the ruins of every liberty founds authority. This is the case with the so-called anarcho-capitalists. This can be seen from Rothbard's wholehearted support for wage labor and the rules imposed by property owners on those who use but do not own their property. Rothbard basing himself on abstract individualism cannot help but justify authority over liberty. Overall, we can see that the logic of the right libertarian definition of freedom ends up negating itself because it results in the creation and encouragement of authority, which is the opposite of freedom. For example, as Ayn Rand points out, quote, man has to sustain his life by his own effort. The man who has no right to who the product of his effort has no means to, to, to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. The Ayn Rand lexicon objectivism from A to Z pages 388 and to 389. But as is shown, capitalism is based on, as Proudhon put it, workers working for an entrepreneur who pays them and keeps their products. And so is a form of theft. Thus, by libertarian capitalism's own logic, capitalism is not based on freedom, but on wage slavery. For interest, profit, and rent are derived from a worker's unpaid labor. And if a society is run on the wage and profit-based system suggested by these so-called anarcho-capitalists and libertarian capitalists, freedom becomes a commodity. The more money you have, the more freedom you get. Then, since money is only available to those who earn it, Libertarianism is based on that classic saying. Arbit Mike Frey, work makes one free, which the Nazis placed on the gates of their concentration camps. Of course, since it is capitalism, this motto is somewhat different from those at the top. In this case, it is other people's work make one free. Truism in any society based on private property and the authority that stems from it. Thus, it is debatable that a libertarian or so-called anarcho-capitalist society would have less unfreedom or coercion in it than actually existing capitalism. In contrast to anarchism, so-called anarcho-capitalism with its narrow definitions restricts freedom to only a few aspects of social life and ignores domination and authority beyond those aspects. As Peter Marshall pointed out, the right libertarian's definition of freedom is entirely negative. It calls for the absence of coercion but cannot guarantee the positive freedom of individual autonomy and independence. By confining freedom to such a narrow range of human action, these so-called anarcho-capitalists are, not, are clearly not a form of, ca- uh, of anarchism. Real anarchists support freedom in every aspect of an individual's life.